Okay, hello everybody. Uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. This is our second attempt now to do this hangout. Um, we're, the first one failed because uh, I guess I lost my internet connection for a while. But uh, well, we're going to start over from the beginning. We're in doing this study on the book of Proverbs. Uh, if you didn't see the previous studies on Proverbs, please go, go back and watch all of those. They're uploaded on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. Uh, we're going to pick up where we left off uh, last time, uh, chapter 24, verse 19. First, let me ask uh, Brother Stephen to say hi to everybody. Hey, everybody. Brother Stephen here. As usual, looking forward to another night of fellowship, learning, and spreading the gospel, which I can't wait to do in about 50 minutes. Hopefully, we don't run into more technical difficulties. Okay, I'm just pulling up my uh, proverb, my um, Bible Gateway program here. Give me just a second to get that going here. All right, I'll read this in the uh, KJV first, and then we'll look at it in the Amplified, starting with verse 19. It says, Fret not thyself because of evil men, neither be thou envious at the wicked, for there shall be no reward to the evil man, the candle of the wicked shall be put out. So we have a second chance to comment on that verse. I think I went on and on too long last time. I'll try to condense my comment, but go ahead first. All right. Well, as I as I said last time while looking at it, it's um don't be envious, you know, in the ways of, you know, wicked people because, you know, sometimes it seems like you know, the way, you know, even though like they're, you know, wicked or evil people that seems like they're just succeeding or always, you know, getting what they want, you know, but yet they're doing it by, you know, evil ways. Although, as you said in our first comment, you could also relate this to um, more in more of a spiritual sense, but I'll let you talk about that since that was your comment. And then it says, you know, there shall be no reward to the evil man. You know, saying that there's really, you know, as I said it last time, like there's nothing that really profits by, you know, doing, you know, these, you know, evil and bad things. You know, as it said, as I said, the candle of the wicked, you know, shall be put out. So, you know, I also thought that could be a metaphor to death. I didn't say that last time, but yeah, like so far I've covered everything I said last time. So I'll let you, you know, say what you had to say. Okay. Uh, one of the things that I was point I wanted to make was that uh, when we read the scriptures, uh, there's various ways that we can interpret it. Uh, one is based upon the intent of the writer and the context of the message, and that's very important. That's a uh, contextual, historical, literal uh, viewpoint, and that's the that's the one that is the primary purpose of the scriptures. But then we also have um, personal interpretations based upon our life's experiences. And sometimes a verse will mean something to me that doesn't mean to you and vice versa, just because of my life's experiences. Uh, and, and then there's also a spiritual application. And I mentioned that uh, brother Eric, who's often here with us in these hangouts, he many times will see the gospel in, in almost every verse and he's spiritualizing it. And all, all of these, these methods are valid. Uh, but what I see in these, in these verses here uh, are some things that maybe, maybe you wouldn't have seen just because we have looking at it through different eyes. So I said that uh, uh, fret not thyself because of evil men, neither be thou envious at the wicked uh, for there shall be no reward of the evil man. Well, when it talks about evil and wicked men, uh, in, the, in the context of the book of Proverbs, it's not really writing about salvation. It's writing about wisdom. Solomon is writing, saying, I'm writing this down to my son, hoping that he will gain wisdom. If you're wise, your life is going to uh, be better off. So that's the intent of the writer. Uh it's not really about salvation. But if we look at it from the terms of salvation and spiritualize it, the question is, the, the evil men, the wicked people, uh, who are they? They would be the people 
who are uh, not saved. Because even though uh, I still have some sinful thoughts and deeds in my life, regretfully I admit that, uh, I try not to, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, I've, I've still got the, uh, the, the, the fleshly uh, struggle going on, in my, the old man versus the new man, the Holy Spirit versus the flesh. So uh, knowing that, uh, I, I may do some things that uh, might, I might have to say, well, that was wicked. You know, like I lost my temper with, with my wife, say, for example, or, or I got envious of what somebody else had. And, and uh, so we, we are wicked in that sense, but because we're saved, we're not really considered wicked, we're considered righteous. So if we look at it from that perspective, the wicked man, the evil man that's referenced in these verses here, uh, that could be talking about someone that's lost. And if, it's, if we look at it in a spiritual way and say, this is a lost person, then we can also say that when we get to the very end of the verse, the point you were citing there in verse 20, it says the candle of the wicked shall be put out. And that brings up the, the question that you and I have talked on a few occasions already about uh, what happens in, uh, in eternity. Do, do the wicked, the lost people, do they go on in eternal torment forever? Or is their candle put out? Do they just no longer exist? So when I see an expression like their candle will be put out, it makes me think of annihilation, uh, just like when I read John 3, 16, and it talks about perishing. To me, perishing is talking about you no longer exist. So that's how I saw it. But see, I'm looking at through from a perspective that I bring to the table. Uh, all right, let me ask you to respond to that. Yeah, a lot of people do like to judge someone's righteousness, you know, based on their own. As they'll put it, they'll put it as they might, you know, phrase it as their fruits, but it's really, you know, based on their works and not their, you know, confession of faith, you know, in Jesus. Now, that's really the main thing I had to say about all of this. And of course, you know, a lot of us are definitely going to interpret, you know, these scriptures, you know, differently due to our, you know, backgrounds and how we see things. But... Definitely, you know, I would just I would definitely agree with you know these verses in general. But overall, I don't really have that much to say besides this. All right, I'm going to go on to the next verse then, since I think the the first time we talked about this before we lost the connection, I think I I I talked too much about it already. So let's go on to verse. Wait, 20. are you going to amplify it? Did you read it and amplify it already, or did I miss that? Uh, oh, I did before. So let me do it again now. Verse 19 and 20 in the Amplified says. Do not get upset because of evildoers or be envious of the wicked, for there will be no future for the evil man. The lamp will, of the wicked will be put out. Now you can see that in verse 20, uh, if you're someone like me that holds to uh, no eternal torment, but, it, but rather eternal death. In other words, they, are, uh, they suffer the second death in the lake of fire. They're destroyed. They're annihilated. They perish. Then this verse 20 here, for there will be no future for the evil man. The lamp of the wicked will be put out. Uh, so that that uh, makes, uh, you know, kind of supports my, uh, my way of seeing that. Um, I'm going to go on to the next verse unless you want to comment further on it. All right, let me go on then. In the KJV, verse 21 says, My son... Fear thou the Lord and the king, and meddle not with them that are given to change. For their calamity shall rise suddenly, and who knoweth the ruin of them both? Hmm. Go ahead and see if you can explain that to me. I actually don't have too much to say about this, but mostly the thing that just sticks out to me is like, you know, the first part of verse 21, you know, my son, fear the Lord, you know, thou the Lord, you know, and thy king. You know, definitely, you know, having a reverence for God, you know, and his laws is definitely going to profit you, you know, obviously here and help you to lay up treasures, you know, in heaven. But um, I would say, you know, just not pretty much messing with, 
you know, anything, you know, evil or just, you know, bad in this instance. It says, for their calamity shall rise suddenly. So, like, it says bad things can happen. But I might be a little bit confused. So I'm just going to stop here and see what you have to say. Well, when I read, uh, it says, uh, uh, and meddle not with them that are given to change. I have no idea what that's referring to. Uh, the people who are given to change, and it says, for their calamity shall rise suddenly, and who knoweth the ruin of them both? So I'm going to look at the Amplified, and maybe it'll shed some light on it. It says, my son, fear the Lord and the king, and do not associate with those who are given to change of allegiance and are revolutionary. For their tragedy will rise suddenly, and who knows their punishment that both the Lord and the king will bring on the rebellious. So uh, if we look at this as it, it says the, the Lord and the king, so if it's talking about a king as in King Solomon, and, and remember this starts off by saying that my son a lot of people think that in Proverbs, when it says, my son, it's God talking to us. But it's not really, the, in the context, uh, it's, the book of Proverbs starts off and repeats numerous times the idea that Solomon says, I am writing these things to my son, hoping that he will gain wisdom. So I think that that's the, uh, the right context for this. So he's, uh, he's saying, my son... And therefore, Solomon is the king. So he's, he's saying not only does this pertain to the Lord, rebelling against the Lord and going your own way, you're going to suffer calamity. But also, if you rebel against the king, which King Solomon or any king that has you know, uh, power over that kingdom, uh, then you're going to suffer calamity. Uh, what's your response to that? Yeah, I like what the Amplified had to say, adding about, you know, like the revolutionary, because I was getting, you know, confused on that at first, even though it's probably pretty simple. But, yeah, a lot of people who are just, you know, rebellious, it can really, you know, it really can, you know, turn around and bite them. Like, but of course, definitely being like rebellious towards, you know, God. And I'm talking about in the sense of the not saved people, who, you know, who don't believe and try to do it their own way. That can definitely obviously bring calamity, you know, on, you know, those people. Well, obviously it will if they are not going to, you know, believe on him. So that's what I'm thinking about as of right now. But I'm still, you know, thinking a lot about this one. All right. Let me continue on then. Um, back to the KJV. Um, these things also belong to the wise. It is not good to have respect of persons in judgment. Uh, he that saith unto the wicked, Thou art righteous, him shall the people curse, nations shall abhor him, but to them that rebuke him shall be delight, and a good blessing shall come upon them. All right, let me see if you can translate that for me. Oh, dear, you read a couple verses there. But um, I guess I'm mostly going to look at, you know, verses 24 and 25. You know, pretty much anyone saying to, you know, a wicked person or just a, like, rebellious person or, you know, any of the above, if you're just going to sit there and call them good and righteous and, you know, and, like, praise, you know, people, like, who do, like, wicked things, you know, people, you know, in general just aren't going to like it. You know, they're not going to respect it and they're not going to like you you know, in that sense. And as it says, nations will abhor him. Yeah, you know, but to them that rebuke him shall be the light. Okay, you know what? I just got caught, got caught up slightly on that, so I'll let you talk. Well, the reason I asked you to interpret it for me is because uh, it doesn't make any sense to me. Um, that's, why, that's why I'm a KJV firstist, but I won't limit myself to it. I hope that if you're watching this now and, uh, you know, if you're a KJV onlyist, as I was for 25 years, I, uh, I've studied Dr. Peter Ruckman's writings. I have about 40 of his books. He's, he's the king of KJV onlyists. Uh, 
And uh, I, I taught that viewpoint, I defended it. And then I finally, a few years ago, was persuaded that it's, it's a mistake to rely only on it. And this is this verses here an example to me, I'm, I'm an educated person. And yet I read the verses and it's like a little jigsaw puzzle. I can't figure it out. Can it do any harm to look at another translation or a commentary or the amplified translation or ask Brother Stephen or somebody else, hey, help me, help me with this. Uh, if, if you think that relying only on the KJV and you can't consult any other source like another translation or a commentary or another per, another uh, brother, then... Uh, you know, that's, if that's the way you want to do it, that's fine. But for me, I think sometimes it's helpful to to consider uh, other translations. And we'll look at the Amplified and see if it's helpful. And that's verse, uh, uh, verse 23 says, These also are sayings of the wise. To show partiality in judgment is not good. He who says to the wicked, You are righteous. Peoples will curse him. Nations will denounce him. Now, see, that is real clear to me. And we look at it in the KJV in verse 24. It says, He that saith unto the wicked, Thou art righteous, him shall the people curse, nations shall abhor him. Well, see, now, now that I've read it in the Amplified, I go back and read it, and now I can understand it. But I wouldn't have understood it unless I first looked at the Amplified. Now, you might be thinking, if you're watching this now, you might say, well, Brother Luke, I, you're, you're not very bright, are you, if you didn't understand it initially? Well, maybe not. But for people like me that may be not bright enough to understand it initially, uh, then I say that uh, looking at the Amplified can be helpful for people like me. Uh, then it says in verse 24, no, verse 25, but to those honorable judges who rebuke the wicked, it will go well with them, and they find delight, and a good blessing will come upon them. See, now, that's really easy to understand. Let me compare that with verse 25 in the KJV. It says, but to them that rebuke him shall be delight, and a good blessing shall come upon them. Okay, now, it's easy when I go back to look at the KJV after I've read the Amplify, I can go back and say, well, see, it, I should have understood it the first time, but I didn't. I didn't until, uh, without the help of the Amplified. So uh, if you're like me, if you're somebody that, even though, you know, I have higher education, you know, I've studied, read a lot, but sometimes I read a verse in the KJV and it just stumps me the way it's written. Uh, it's also full of double negatives, the language, and uh, it's, it's just not normal modern day English. So it uh, probably, apart from Proverbs, and there are some things in Job, Proverbs, and I would say probably in the Psalms also, but uh, excluding those books, if we go through most of the other books of the Bible, probably most of the verses, let's say 95% of the verses, uh, the KJV language is not too hard, but the five percent of the verses that you, I just don't get without some help, some help, then uh, I think it'd be foolish on my part to not uh, go out apart from the KJV to see if I can't find some way of understanding it. Uh, what's your response to all that? Yeah, I can agree because. And for a second, I thought I was the only person who was confused when I, you know, read that verse at first, when I read those verses at first, because, you know, the language, I've like, I felt like something was just shifted at first. And I'm like, wait, what? And then, you know, I still thought verse 24 on its own, you know, still stood out and had a clear, like, message on its own. But I just, but then I felt like the connection just kind of broke when I then went into verse 25. But then when, you know, I saw the amplified version, then it, you know, made sense. You know, now looking back at it, you know, talking about, you know, show like not, you know, showing, you know, like fate, like favoritism and being, you know, and of course being, you know, too partial, you know, with being a judge and to be, you know, a good judge, you know, but that, you know, I couldn't quite, you know, pick that up, you know, when I just read the KJV on its own first. So I guess, you know, it really is good, you know, sometimes to, you know, see, you know, other things look and maybe like look at like, you know, the amplified, you know, commentary or something like that. 
that way it can, you know, help you to understand it better. Cause it's good, you know, to have understanding in the, in, you know, every type of situation and in every verse here in God's word. Well, for, for me, um, I'm not trying to promote um, that you should not be a KJV only. If you, if you can read the KJV and you can understand it uh, easily all the time, and you don't need to go outside of it to try to get a, a better understanding, then uh, I'm happy for you. But for me and many other people, uh, looking at a modern translation or going into a commentary, something like that, if it'll help us understand it, um, for me, uh, I'm going to take advantage of that. Uh, okay, let me go on and read it back to the KJV, um, verse 26. Every man shall kiss his lips that giveth a right answer. <laughs> okay, I think that verse... Uh, I think that verse is connected to the verse 25. Uh, it's, it's a continuation of that thought that when you give the right answer where you're going to rebuke the wicked instead of saying it's okay, I think this is a follow-up verse. Let me read it ampl amplified and see if it seems to fit. He kisses the lips and wins the hearts of people who gives a right and straightforward answer. I don't know. This, this may just verse stand alone. See, one of the things about the, the book of Proverbs is that it's really unique. The, the only book that, that also does something like this is uh, the book of Psalms. See, Proverbs is a, is a um, uh, it's not a historical record of historical events and people. Uh, like when we read Genesis, it's a story of, of, of people's lives and, and per particular history of the world. And Proverbs, though, is not like that. If you, even from the study of Matt, you can see that it's, um, it's a whole bunch of thoughts that are not necessarily strung together. Each thought we could refer to as a proverb. A proverb, we could, if you look up the word proverb in the dictionary, it might refer to the book of Proverbs, but it might refer to Aesop's and, and Confucius and those kinds of Proverbs. But I think it would probably say a wise saying, a statement uh, that will teach you some, some way to be wise. And some of the Proverbs that we're reading here, um, it's a single verse that stands alone by itself. And from that one verse, we can learn a great wisdom that will help us in our lives. And then other times, the Proverbs is two or three or four or five verses strung together to make the point of the proverb. And so it's an interesting book. And the book of Psalms is, is like that in a sense, too, that uh, it's really uh, a series of songs uh, or poems or songs that most of them were written by King David. But uh, so they're not, it's not a story, a historical record of events like you find in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and, and uh, you know, uh, Romans, and, and uh, you know, Genesis and Exodus. These are all stories of a history of peoples. Uh, all right, brother, want to respond to any of that? Mm, I don't have too much to say about this, but I definitely agree that, you know, Proverbs is a very, you know, unique book, and that everyone can, you know, benefit everyone you know, in pretty much, you know, every way. But overall, not much to say. Okay, I want to back up to that one verse, though, and ask you to respond to that. Now, what did you think when I read verse 26 in the KJV? Uh, did it make sense to you at all? Um, and then I read it in the Amplified, and uh, I, th I think we understand it now. But it says, every man shall kiss his lips that giveth a right answer. Did that, did that really make sense to you? Every man shall kiss his lips that giveth a right answer. Well, um, I don't remember what you said in the Amplified. Could you reread that verse in the Amplified for me again? Well, the fact that I have to read it kind of answers the question uh, that it, it, that verse right there, we didn't have a hard time explaining it. But in the Amplified, it says, he kisses the lips and wins the hearts of people who gives a right and straightforward answer. 
which just means that like those people, you know, appreciate, you know, like honesty and just straightforwardness pretty much. Uh, yeah, but uh, if, if I said that, uh, um, hey, uh, Brother Stephen, you know, he, he's, he's kissing the lips and uh, by giving a straightforward answer. I mean, today, are, how are you going to take that? That, um, <laughs> sorry, but um, I guess when you might think about that, I might be a little bit like, huh? Like, I might be a little bit, you know, baffled slightly, I guess. But, yeah, that's a, that's a, that's what I guess my reaction would be, you know, a gut one at first. Yeah, well, okay, so I'll read it one more time in the KJV, so I think we can make sense of it now. Every man shall kiss his lips, so every person will be happy. If, if you're the kind of – everybody will be happy about Brother Stephen – when, because Brother Stephen gives the right answers. He's giving honest answers. Uh, so the people are all gonna be happy about it. And it says, shall kiss your lips. That's not a common thing for people today in America. When someone does something good, everybody starts kissing you on the lips. Uh, so maybe at that time, that was a way of, um, of people, uh, you know, saying, hey, I'm really proud of you. I'm, it says, let me read it one more time in the Amplified. He kisses the lips and wins the hearts of people. Uh, in other words, the people will really love you if you give a right and straightforward answer. Okay. All right. I'm going to move on to the next verse, at verse 27 in, in the KJV. Prepare thy work without and make it fit for thyself in the field. And afterwards, build thine house. Hmm. Well, well, it's talking about making fit for themselves and then building your house. I don't know why, but the first part of that verse is just confusing me. Though, I think I'll get this once we talk about it in Amplify, but I'm just slightly confused right now. Well, you see, in, in most of the books of the Bible, you're going to read it and not have this kind of a be, be confounded as you are. Not only you, but me too. And, you know, you're... You're close to graduate from college. I graduated from college, you know, 45, 40, let me see, 1974, however long ago that is. Um, but so it's been a long time, but, you know, we're both educated people, and yet we, uh, we are, are confounded by, by this language. But um, and when I read it in the Amplified, you're going to see that we're not confounded at all. Uh, I doubt we will be. Let me see what it says. Um, verse 27, prepare your work outside and get it ready for yourself in the field. Afterward, build your house and establish a home. Is that, is that hard to understand in any way? Not nearly like the King James, but I don't think so. Like, I would say it's more straightforward. But right now, I don't know why, but my mind's just totally blank right now. So I'll let you, let's say, make your commentary. Okay. Uh... Yeah, uh, well, the way your mind is, is kind of uh, blank and stuff, is, it's a result of trying to struggle with some of these verses. And I, I was making the case earlier that most of the books of the Bible, we're not going to run into this problem. But for some reason, many of these Proverbs are written in a way that is not that easy to understand. Uh, some of them are pretty clear cut in the KJV, uh, but, but many of them are not. 
And that's why I resort to looking at uh, the Amplified or some other translation that can help me. But it says, prepare your work outside and get it ready for yourself in the field. Uh, what would you think if, if I said that to you and we weren't even talking about the Bible right now and we're just talking, I said, hey, uh, 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 Stephen, uh, prepare, prepare your work outside and get, your, get, get it ready uh, for yourself in the field. I mean, how would you, what would you think of that statement? I would just think of, you know, any, you know, outdoor labor that I'm doing pretty much, you know, out there. Like, well, when you say field, I think about, you know, like, like gardens and crops. So I'd just be thinking about, you know, labor, you know, I'm doing like out there and just being diligent, you know, and getting ready to work mm -hmm. or like create something or something like that. Yeah. And then the, the, the final part says afterward, build your house and establish a home. Um, so you prepare the field. So maybe it's saying you clear the field. I mean, you have to clear the land before you can build a house on it, don't you? Yeah, especially me being a building construction major. Yeah. Like, so if you look at it from that perspective, okay, let's say that the point of what I'm telling you is if you want to build your home on this land, first you better do a good job of preparing it before you start thinking about building the home. Prepare the work outside and get it ready first. Then afterwards, then you can build and establish your home. Yeah, because site work is very important, you know, in the construction, you know, industry. Like you always got to prepare your site, you know, and get it ready, you know, for any, you know, site work that's going to happen. Well, construction might not have been quite the same back then as it is now. But still, like you've got to prepare the field well you know, and get, you know, mobilized and ready to go and get your materials ready so that way you can build, you know, efficiently and effectively, you know, in any situation. All right, I'll go on now, but it seems to be pretty clear once we are looking at the Amplified and we see, uh, we, we see that, hey, it's just basically saying, if you want to build a, a, a home, don't be foolish and rush into building the home. Be first, you've got to prepare the land right. Level it off, clear all the trees and everything out of it. Make sure it's nice and level, and, and then you're ready to build your home. Don't rush into it without laying, uh, you know, doing the, the prep work. Uh, then it says, uh, verse 28 in the KJV, Be not a witness against thy neighbor without cause, and deceive not with thy lips. Well, this, this seems like it's a lot more obviously clearer than, you know, what I looked at in the previous one. This time it's just saying, you know, don't be, you know, a false witness and, you know, and deceive not other lips and do it. Like, don't be a liar and, you know, don't be a false witness. Don't bring up, you know, accusations that, hold on, don't bring up accusations that don't exist or don't just do it for, you know, any, you know, stupid reason. You know, it says without cause. Like, it needs to be legitimate, and it needs to be, you know, honest. You know, don't be dishonest, and just don't bear, you know, false witness. You know, that's what I think it's saying in this verse. Uh, yeah, it, it seems really quite straightforward, and I expect the Amplified would just agree with that very thing. It says, do not be a witness against your neighbor without cause, and do not deceive with your lips. Speak neither lies nor half-truths. Uh, now, some of these things are just so so obvious, you wonder, well, why should we even have to be taught such a thing? Because, because I mean, everybody knows you shouldn't be doing these things. You're not supposed to spread lies and deceive people and or hell, tell half-truths, and, and you shouldn't uh, uh, witness against your neighbor without cause. Uh, I'm not sure what that really means. Do not be a, do not be a witness against your neighbor without cause. So in other words, I guess that fits with the other one about deception. You know, if, if you're a witness to something that your neighbor has done some wrong thing, then, you know, you should be willing to testify against him. But if, if he, he hasn't done anything, don't go start making up stuff about him just because maybe other people are saying, Hey, uh, join me in this lie, and will will help me lie about it. 
Um, these things are pretty pretty obvious that most standards of you know civilization and decency, we can see that this is there. And th these are also clear things that we learn in the basic lessons of the, the Ten Commandments. I'm ready to go on. I mean, anything else on that? No, I think it's pretty straightforward. Okay, I'll go on to the next verse. Is uh, um, Verse 29, Say not, I will do so to him as he hath done to me. I will render to the man according to his work. Now, does that sound familiar? Definitely. It reminds me, you know, of what Jesus was saying when, you know, he was talking about, you know, strike, you know, like what it reminds me of is, you know, don't, do, you know, use an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth. You know, if one guy punches you on one cheek, let him punch you in the other one, too. Well, I'm paraphrasing, but that's what it reminds me of most. Like, don't just basically just don't hold it to an eye for an eye, you know, or a tooth or a, t or a tooth for a tooth. Don't just, you know, treat someone like crap, but instead, you know, show them love. At least that's what I at least that's what I'm thinking as I say this. What do you say? Yeah, it, it sounds very much what Jesus would had said. Uh, and yet uh, this was written probably about eight or nine hundred or a thousand years before Jesus. Uh, I think David was a thousand years before Jesus and then Solomon was his son. So say around 900 years before Jesus said it, uh, this was written in uh, Proverbs. And so Proverbs, Psalms, the prophets, the law, all these were the Old Testament scriptures that, that Jesus many times would quote from or paraphrase from. Let me read it in the Amplified. Um, um, do not say, I will do to him as he has done to me. I will pay the man back for his deed. Uh, so how did Jesus say? He says, uh, uh, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Uh, this one is saying, do not do to others as they've done to you. So it's kind of, it's, it's a similar point, but it's kind of an opposite point. This is saying, do not do to others uh, as they've done to you. But Jesus has flipped it around and said, do unto others no, um, as you would have them do unto you. Instead of doing do unto others as they did to you, do unto others as you would have them do it. Treat other people the way you want them to treat you. This is saying, uh, don't treat people the way they treated you. If they treated you badly, don't treat them badly in return. So it's they're both uh, great virtuous principles, but you see this, uh, the, the difference between the way they're expressed. I don't really have too much of a comment to add to this because I think it's also just like the previous one is a very straightforward verse. So I think I'm ready to move on. Um, verse 30, I went by the field of the slothful and by the vineyard of the man void of understanding. And lo, it was all grown over with thorns and nettles had covered the face thereof and the stone wall thereof was broken down. Then I saw and considered it well. I looked upon it and received the instruction. Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep, so shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth, traveleth and, uh, and thy want as an armed man. That all was part of the one proverb. You see, that point I made earlier is that sometimes a proverb is a single verse that stands alone. It, it, by itself, it makes the point. And this, here we have now, how many verses were there? Let me see. Uh, verse 30, 
31, 32, 33, 34. That's five verses. Five verses strung together to make the point that time. All right? Well, looking at, you know, the first part, you know, it's talking about ways that are not good to be. As it says, I'm, as I'll paraphrase it, you know, I went by the way of, you know, the lazy, you know, and the vineyard of the man void of understanding. As it's saying, you know, like being, you know, lazy, you know, without knowledge or understanding in this situation, it's like, as it says, it was all grown over with thorns and, you know, nettles, you know, had covered the face thereof and the stone wall was broken down. It's showing you like bad results, like bad meat you know of it so it's like someone without understanding or you know too much laziness might not have good control you know over their lives you know or good maintenance you know thereof and it says let's say looking on it says you know poverty will come as one that traveleth which means it could come swiftly it says you know with a little sleep like so maybe it's saying you know let your guard down or something like that and then like calamity could strike you, you know, quickly. At least that's my first thought as when it comes. Well, also it says poverty can come on quick. It also reminds me of Jesus coming like a thief in the night. But then again, that's just a thought that I just thought about. But that's what I'm, that's what's going through my mind as of right now. What do you have to say? Well, uh, what the, the point of the verse is that if you're lazy, you're going to end up in poverty. Uh, but the interesting thing about the way it's written is it's it's not only talking about that person and, you know, the, the, the cause and effect. They are reaping what they've sown. The, what they've sown was nothing because they're lazy and wouldn't get out of bed and work. So therefore, their field's grown over and they don't have any kind of crop or anything. So they have poverty. Uh, they So they're reaping what they've sown. But the interesting thing about the verse to me is that this is written from the perspective of an observer. And in other words, you can, he's making a prediction here. He's saying, I saw this land that was all grown over. And, uh, well, let me read it again from that perspective. Um, it says, um, I went by the field of the slothful. So he, I went by a, a, a lazy man's field and he didn't understand this basic thing that you got to hustle and work. And, and lo, it was all grown over with thorns and nettles had covered the face of it. The stone wall thereof was broken down. He, he didn't even repair the walls of, the, of his uh, property. Then I saw and considered it well. I looked upon it and received instruction. So he received instruction. In other words, he learned something from this. And that is what he learned was a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. In other words, being lazy and resting instead of being work a hard worker, that results in verse 34. So shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth and thy uh, want as an armed man. I'm going to read that all in the Amplified now, though. But do you, do you find it interesting the way it's written kind of as a predictor? It's saying, I saw this field and... This is what I'm predicting because he's lazy. Uh, he, he ends up in poverty. Yeah, I think it is interesting, you know, looking at it, you know, through the point of an observer in this point of view. But I mean, I definitely agree with everything, you know, in this verse that, you know, being lazy, you know, and not working hard can definitely result in, you know, poverty and things not going, you know, your way. But, you know, now looking at it, it seems like it's pretty straightforward. Let's take a look at it, like what the Amplified has to say. All right. Uh, uh, it says, I went by the field of a lazy man and by the vineyard of the man lacking understanding and common sense. And behold, it was all overgrown with thorns and nettles were covering its surface and its stone wall was broken down. When I saw, I considered it well. I looked and received instruction, quote, yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest and daydream, unquote. Then your poverty will come as a robber and your want like an armed man. 
So he's saying that he's learned a lesson. He received instruction in verse 32. He's learned something from this observation. That's something that I guess we should all learn from this observation. Um, okay, any other thoughts on that, on those verses, or just the, the study as a, as a whole? Yeah, poverty definitely can strike you quick, you know, if you get lazy and, like, too, like, if you just, like, slip out of it too much. But overall, like, this last study, there were definitely some verses that were, you know, confusing for me, you know, when I went through this, but... You know, overall, it's been a very interesting one because there's been so, – but then again, you know, when you look at it next, it just talks about like simple stuff like, you know, like judging, you know, impartially or, you know, not bearing false witness, you know, just being honest. Yeah, so it's pretty, you know, straight up, but sometimes like when reading in this language, it can be a little bit confusing, except definitely not, you know, bashing the KJV. I think it's the best one out there, but – yeah, I just got a little bit baffled at some points. Okay. Yeah, the, the purpose of all of our studies here are, are not to promote uh, or or um, um, argue against KJV onlyism. Uh, you know, you're you're free to hold that position as far as I'm concerned. I, I look at it as I look at the KJV, I trust it as the Holy Scriptures, but then I'm willing to look at uh, uh, anything else that, that will help me understand it uh, in those times where the KJV is kind of stumping me. It's not that clear, and so I'm, I'm just looking for help. I want to understand the Scriptures, and I want to get help wherever I can. And uh, if, if you're someone that doesn't want to look apart from the KJV, that, that's fine. You're, that's, uh, that's your uh, prerogative. Uh, now, uh, we, I don't know how long this has lasted because, uh, you know, we at, we're end up delayed uh, with our false starts and stuff, but uh, 47 think, minutes. Yeah. So this is a good time anyway, to start at the end of, stop at the end of this chapter. And um, we always want to reserve some time in the end so that we can uh, tell you the viewer, uh, the, the good news, the, the gospel. You know, you've heard the word gospel. Everybody's heard that. And you've heard the, the gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You know, these are, and you've heard uh, uh, someone say, well, that's the gospel truth. You know, and the word gospel is, is a common word, but it's, it's a Greek word. And, and the true meaning of the word gospel is, is simple. It, it translates to good news. So, we want to share the gospel with you, share the good news. <laughs> I can't help but smile and laugh and get happy just even thinking of, of thinking about talking about it. Uh, because I believe that even though it translates to good news, it should translate to the greatest news ever. You know, the, the greatest story ever told. The true, it's a true story. It's a love story. It's the, the good news that Jesus Christ is offering all of us eternal life in heaven as a free gift. So and then that's, that is the gospel. That is the truth. That's the truth you need to understand and believe that salvation, eternal life in heaven is available to all of us as a free gift from Jesus. Now I'm going to ask Brother uh, Stephen here to go into more detail, but I'm also going to say first that uh, in every one of my videos, uh, I, I post a statement of faith in the description box, followed by some scripture verses to prove the point that salvation is a free gift. So uh, after you listen to Brother Stephen, uh, I hope you will go look at the description box Read the statement of faith. These, this is the core doctrines of Christianity, of biblical Christianity, not the kind of Christianity you're getting in many churches around America and all over the world, but the Christianity, uh, the, the type of uh, the, what we learn uh, from the Bible, biblical Christianity. 
And uh, there's a huge distinction between biblical Christianity and the Christianity of the world. So, uh, yeah, afterward, after you're done watching this, please read the Statement of Faith and the scriptures uh, that were posted. But for now, Brother Stephen, will you take a few minutes and explain, tell them about the good news that salvation is a free gift? Oh, yeah. This is my favorite part of every night. Well, unlike, you know, some of the scriptures that you might get confused on, the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's awesome news. And it's very, very simple, you know, to understand. So as usual, I'll start off by reading my favorite verse. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And that right there is the gospel, you know, in a nutshell, talking about the story about Jesus, how he died, was buried, and rose again for our sins and gives us a free gift of eternal life and eternal security to those who believe on him. But why did he have to come? Well, I'm going to start off by reading in a few verses from Romans. As it's like, as it says in Romans 3.10, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. And as it says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, you see, you know, as men, as humans, we're born into sin. We're sinners. There's nothing we can do on our own that will ever be pleasing to God. There's nothing we can do on our own to, you know, earn our way into heaven. And... You know, in reality, as it says, we come short. And as it says in the first half of Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. Of course, when it says wages, it's talking about, you know, earnings. Wages are something you earn and that you deserve. So it's saying that we deserve death. I mean, sorry, we deserve death because we're sinners. And, you know, we all deserve it. And, of course, this is talking about not just the first death, but the second death you know, which is, you know, the punishment that all of us deserve that comes, which is far worse than the first death or anything you could ever have in this life. But there's good news, and it's revealed in the second half of that same verse, Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, I'm going to enterize the word gift. A gift is something that has been bought. You didn't earn it. You know, you didn't pay for it. Somebody else did and gave it to you for free, and it's yours to have. And that's the issue with salvation. You see, Jesus being God's perfect son, you know, the eternal God, came here in the flesh, and he lived the perfect life we couldn't live. He was sinless, pleasing to his father, fulfilled the law, performed miracles. And, you know, he proved who he was when he rose again from the dead. But the thing was... Because of our sins, he died on the cross. He was buried and he rose again. And he put all of our sins on him when he died, you know, crucifying them with him, you know, taking them away. And he offers us the free gift of everlasting life, you know, because he paid for it all. He did the one sacrifice that was acceptable to God because our works aren't good enough. So he did it for us. And it's very clear on how to get salvation. I've got one verse here that you know, comes directly from the you know, words of Jesus, and then one from the apostles. And it says in John 6, 47, this is Jesus speaking, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. And as it says in Acts 16, 30 through 31, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And it's very simple. All you have to do you know, is believe is believe. And trust him. It's not just believing, you know, that, let's say, a that a God exists. It's, you know, believing, you know, in Jesus, trusting that in what he did and that that alone will save you and that it's enough. And that, you know, it's trusting that he'll keep his promise. Now, it says that he won't lie. Jesus won't lie to you and he won't take this back. And actually, the best part about salvation is you're eternally secure, as it says in John 10, 28. And I, this is Jesus talking, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. You see, once you're saved, you're saved forever, and you're sealed, and you'll never, ever have to worry about losing your salvation. 
So it's once saved, always saved. Because Jesus paid it all for us. He did the whole sacrifice. And all he asks is this, that we believe on him. As it further says, you know, in John 6, 29, the, this is the work of God. This is Jesus again speaking, that ye believe on him who he has sent. Now I iterate there is no other way apart from Jesus. As it says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. This is Jesus speaking again. No man will come to the Father but by me. See, there's no other thing that works. There's no other sacrifice, no belief other than Jesus. Anything else is a ticket to death. Only what Jesus did can save you, but it's a free gift that he paid for on his own. And all you have to do is just believe on him. It's that simple. Just believe and trust on him because he died, was buried and rose again and, you know, to pay for your sins. And he get, you know, offers you that gift of everlasting life and eternal security with him. So that's my invitation to you tonight is that you'll believe on Jesus and be saved tonight. So come to Jesus and live. And that's all I have. <laughs> all right, brother. Well done. That was a beautiful beautiful uh, salvation message. Uh, I hope if you're watching this video that you've listened carefully and that uh, you're, you should be just exhilarated. You should be thrilled. If, if you believe this message, if you believe that you're going to go to heaven and it's guaranteed simply because you're trusting Jesus completely. And then if, if you really believe that, you should be jumping for joy right now. <laughs> I've been I've been joyful and happy for 29 years because of this this promise from Jesus. And I, I want you to have that joy and this blessed assurance too. So if you do put your faith in Jesus, uh, just make a comment on the video. I'd love to hear that you. Are you going to be joining us, Brother Stephen and me, in eternity in heaven? Um, thank you for watching. Brother Stephen, thank you for participating, uh, particularly since we had the complication. I had to start this hangout twice tonight. Thanks for hanging in there with me. And uh, I hope everybody will, will join us nightly, uh, 7 p.m. Pacific time, for more uh, Bible study with Brother Luke. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.